your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now How I need you now Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness I'm calling on the God of Mary Whose favor rests upon the lowly I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath but I've got my own giants oh God my God I need you oh God my God I need you now how I need you now oh rock oh rock of angels I'm standing
then, the same God now. Isn't that, wasn't that a fantastic song which just, just uh, re- lets us realise how great God is? Now, some of you will know that I've recently been overseas and I, while I was away, my glasses, uh, I needed to keep changing my glasses so that I could read better. But we'll see, see how we... If I take those off, that's better, isn't it? Okay. While I was away, because the what you have in can put in your bag is not too much, so a thick Bible can be a bit of a problem. Well, depends on what your priorities are. So I p- picked up this book. Some of you will have read this, Meet Jesus. It's a great book to start off with. And I was going through that while I was away, one for each day, or almost one for each day and towards the end which is uh, after the Lord's Supper which we'll be having in a moment Jesus is on the cross and he's speaking to a bloke and there's a story about him there just a couple of little things out of that story so there were three there were three on the cross there was Jesus and the other two and one of them was harassing Jesus telling him Telling him, virtually saying he's worthless. You're not saving us. You're not, you, don't, you don't love us. It says the bad man on the cross told him that he should be quiet. He said, you should be more, sorry, the other one. There's, there's two on the cross. One's harassing Jesus and the other just says, but a bad man on the, cro- on the other cross told him he should be quiet. He said, you should be more afraid of God. We will die here as well as him. They expected to die. They only had hours to live. We two men have done very bad things, so that it is right that we should die. But this man has not done anything wrong. He recognised that Jesus was sinless. Then the man said to Jesus, remember me, Jesus, when you start to rule in your kingdom... And Jesus replied, I promise you, today you will be with me in paradise. I take it that he's the first person in heaven with Jesus after Jesus died on the cross. And he's a sinner, but he confessed his sin. And he realised that only God could save him. So So God was able to save that man now. As we sang in the song, that's that man then, he can also save us now. And when we, when we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, which we'll do in a moment, about the, the actual communion, it does talk about after that, that we should, we should confess our sins to God before we do so, because we need to have a right heart with God. So let's just spend a time just thinking of the things in our lives that are trouble to us, where we have sinned against other people, but more particularly God. And usually that if we're sinning against other people, we're not actually loving them as much as we might think. And God's asked us to love other people. So let's just close our eyes. Lord, I, I just pray that we might, that you will bring to our hearts and minds the things where we need to do business with people and more particularly with you. Where we need to make our hearts right before you. And I, Lord, I pray that we might make that a daily happening, just part of our DNA that we do business with you each day, that we don't let the sun settle on our sin, on our anger, even the, little, even the white lies that we tell. They're still lies. We may not be murderers, Lord, but what's, I just pray that you might cleanse our hearts. Give us a right attitude towards other people probably particularly those in our, who are living in our home. 
whom we see more than anyone else. Our neighbours, our colleagues, our children and grandchildren, the people that we pass in the street. There may be some big things, there may be some small things, but you're a big God and you're bigger than all of those. And so as that man on the cross realised that you and confessed his sin before you, Lord, we confess our sin before you. The great thing is, of course, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a great God who's the same yesterday, today and forever. So if you've got your, uh, your cups, containers, you just peel those off. So this is Paul writing about the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. In remembrance of me, for whoever so who in let me start. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, which he's asked to, us to continually to do. So we celebrate communion every second week. Some places they do it every week, whatever it might be. We can even do it in our own homes as couples, small groups, whatever, but it's God's asked us to remember his death and his passion for us. So let's take the uh, take these elements. Let's take the, the bread, the wafer, the meat cup. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body. Thank you for offering yourself as a substitute for the lamb, but so that our bodies don't need to be broken and sacrificed for you. Thank you that you can give us clean hearts in what you've done for us. And let's drink the cup. We thank you, Lord, for your blood shed for us as it symbolises the washing away of sin. I pray, Lord, that each day that we will remember what you have done for us on the cross so that we might have life everlasting with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we're family. We're a group of people who come from all sorts of different places, but we're still a family. We're all in the family because of Jesus, who we've just celebrated. And there are lots of people in our family that we care for and are having some struggles. So we're going to pray for some of those today. But I do want to start with some verses out of Psalm 145. Now, it's not the whole thing, but it's good for us to start our prayer times firstly with our eyes on, on our Father God because he's the source of our lives and the, the things that trouble us are actually passing things. They come and go some pass more quickly than others. But in all of this, in our temporal lives, 
they come and go, but our eternal life is with our Father. So we're going to start always with pra praising God for who he is. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most trustworthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. I think we've got a few amongst us in that position today. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And I've got to say our songs today reflected all those words about who our Father is. So Heavenly Father, we do come to you. We humble ourselves before you. We remember that we come before you because of Jesus who was crucified and was raised to, from the dead again. And we thank you, Father, for including us in your family, for covering us with the righteousness of Jesus. And that's what you see in us. You recognise us because we are covered in, our, in his righteousness. So, Father, we, we remember our lessons from last week to rejoice in the Lord always, not to worry, but to bring to you our petitions with thanksgiving to know that your peace will follow. So, Father, we want to remember those who are suffering today. They're quite a long list. Gavin and Julia are in Melbourne with her family. Her father's died this recent, this past few days. And we just pray for your grace and mercy, your comfort to be on that whole family. We just pray that Gavin and Julie will be your witness to those family members who are all uh, feeling the pain of the loss. We've got a couple of members who are ill with COVID, Rosemary and Maxine, and um, Jonathan is also ill but not with COVID, so we've just heard about him this morning. Father, we thank you that you are with these people and you never leave them and your healing hand can come upon them and we trust you Lord that as we lift up our voices in praise and thanksgiving and request for your healing that you will do it because you are faithful. We've got a number of people Father you know who are going to be confronting surgery in the next few weeks and we pray Father for each one of them, those people we care about, that you care about that your presence goes with them into this rather tense situation, that your healing hand is upon them, your, the guidance of your, your um, hand upon medical staff, doctors, nurses, who are going to be administering the, the healing that can come from our natural um, systems, but also the ultimate healing comes from your hand. And we thank you that you are going ahead of them and that you will keep them in peace in these times of tense uh, tension. Um, we want to pray, Lord, for Christina's husband who's not well. And we want to pray for Christina too because she's there to minister love and concern and God's mercy to her husband. And we pray that you are going to do your miracle of love and mercy and salvation in that household. We pray for Roger and Bev who are unsure about what's happening with the family in New Zealand but it's a weight on Bev and, and Roger is her support and um, it's a long way away, Lord, and... 
we just ask you to come to them with your grace, your mercy, your peace uh, and help Bev to go through this uh, as she supports and ministers to her family members over there. We've got a number of people who are also going through other health challenges and we pray for your healing upon them, for Graham, for uh, Julie um, and, and others. There may be some who are who we don't even know about, Lord, in amongst us, and, but you are the strength of their heart. And we thank you, Father, that as we come together and pray and ask for your hand upon us, that you are faithful to do this. Your word tells us that you will do this. So thank you. And Father, now as we go into our annual general meeting, we get some really good reminders of how faithful you've been to us as a congregation. And we're going to praise you now, even before we've heard the stories. And we thank you. We thank you for our leaders who, who listen to you, who put requests before you and take from you the wisdom of the guidance of our fellowship. We pray, Lord, for um, the, I'm sure we'll do it later too, for the land that we've requested from you. We don't know how that's going to turn out, but we turn our eyes upon you, Father, and know that you will be faithful to us in, in one way or another. We leave it with you to do something that is the best. So we praise you and we thank you, Father, because you are good to us and because you bind us together in the love of your son, Jesus. So we lift up our hearts to you and our eyes to you and say, come Lord Jesus and be our King, our Saviour, our Lord in this place. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, Ray, can I just ask you to come up, uh, just perhaps be seated here at the front. So just before the service, uh, Ray informed me that she's just recently received a whole uh, uh, results yeah, uh, of a battery of tests to do with her health. And there's quite a long list of, of, um, of uh, issues, uh, potentially very, very serious. So I just said to Ray, at the end of our pastoral prayer, if I can get our elders, and I've got some oil, uh, biblically from James 5, I just want to anoint oil for Ray, and just in our hearts, uh, just be, let's be praying healing and also strength, because they've got uh, a whole lot of medical appointments, financial challenges related to those medical uh, tests coming up, and uh, so there's a fair bit of heavy weight on Gavin and Ray. So uh, let me just uh, anoint with oil and then uh, I'll pray and our elders will just come around. And um, yeah, so Gavin and Ray, we love you. We just thank you for being part of the Andrews Farm Church. You're such uh, giving and serving people. And uh, it, my heart went out to you, Ray, when you were just telling me uh, with some tears, just all that's sort of a big mountain ahead of you. So uh, we're, uh, join your faith with us as we just as we pray. So I just anoint uh, according to scripture and uh, this anointing with oil in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we just, uh, Lord, now lift up uh, our sister in prayer. So, uh, yes, Lord. Today's Bible reading is Ephesians 1, 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to, holy, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God and Father of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glor glorious grace, which he has freely given us in one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be fed into effect when the times reach their fulfilment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ.
with me of in uh, the world of astronomy or our solar system. Uh, picture the moon uh, near our Earth and Mars further away in our solar system. And uh, you read in the paper from time to time there's, there's this uh, scientific search for a particular element, a particular um, uh, aspect or uh, presence of something special on, the, on those two, the moon and the, uh, the planet Mars, that's vital. And when, and when you uh, read, they, they've sent the, uh, the modules and the tests over to Mars, they, they say that there's the possibility they've found that there's a particular substance that they're looking for on those planets. Can you tell me what's, what are they looking for uh, that's vital and they think is just so elemental and, and uh, like significant for humanity when they explore those places. Water. 10 out of 10. They're looking if there's water. Because water brings life. And water enables humans to exist in those places, vast, far-off places. And if they're to have food, uh, they need water to to, for vegetables or for food uh, to, uh, to grow uh, in those areas. So I, I just, I, as I begin my message this morning, I get you to just to join with me as we recognise the significance, even as they, they look for, design all these tests. Is there water on the moon? Is there water on Mars? Significant for, for life and for development. And then have a look at this reading. On the last... And greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. What a powerful, beautiful promise. Back about seven years ago, that verse and that passage in John 7, God himself kept bringing to me and to the core leaders or the founders of this church. When we started meeting in uh, Suki's lounge room in the middle of Andrew's farm and we had week after week, we, we did a church planting course to help us prepare for this new journey of a, of a new church in Andrew's farm and rivers and water and verses like this one were impressed on us. And so that's why, uh, if we could have the next slide, thank you, uh, em emerging out of our, um, our, our uh, sort of like origins and birth, a river of life and hope through Jesus became our sort of logo, our, 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 our sort of caption that little short saying that, that identifies us, our marker, a river of life. Because that verse and those images, and we back then prophetically, six to seven years ago, heard God say to us uh, as the team, and now as the church has grown and as we've developed and as we've kept moving forward, uh, he was, God was saying to us, these rivers are going to flow out of you. And they're going to bring life. They're going to bring change. They're going to make a difference in this area of Andrew's farm. And, and God's uh, kept in calling us to be in captioning Devon Park as well. And then on the left you can see this other, uh, just yeah, leave it on there, the love and the life and hope of Jesus transforming, making a difference, uh, changing the environment. And so back then... Uh, we used different ways and understandings of trying to define and describe what God was calling us to do. And uh, there were images that he gave us, particularly from Ed Silvoso, when most of our church went through a course with that uh, Argentinian evangelist. And uh, he said, we're calling you to change the spiritual poverty of Andrew's farm. Those who were far from God would come to him and, and be spiritually changed material poverty and, uh, and personal poverty. We, we were seeing people's lives oppressed. And so this transforming with a river of life 
our calling, I remind us on this AGM Vision Sunday, is to be going out and bringing that life and being that living water, river flowing and impacting all that we touch. My friends, that's our origins. That's where we started. And then over these last few years, uh, if we could just have that next one then, uh, I've been impressing on you the vision and every Sunday I try to be diligent and it's no accident and it's not to just to bore you, it's to impress on you these values are important. Now, I, I try to be a little bit sort of tricky about that and I highlight one. Can any of you just yell out which of those values really highlights for you and just to quickly just what which one of those jumps out at you and you really you really like that that's a value that we have in our church do, does anyone do, do can you just anyone want to just respond i'm inviting for a response here so that's what really fires you you love that's up there yarn and you're glad we highlight that thank you the mission of our church that's a value if you belong to this church we want you on fire for mission what else? Does anyone else have any different value? The intimacy with God. I'm not surprised you say that, Glenn, it's because Glenn is always talks about the character of God and the fatherhood of God. So for you, when I highlight the values, the intimacy of God is one that jumps out for you, that's special and that's important and that you would want everyone in our church to be, to be developing that closeness with God the Father. Thank you. The one I love is respect. Do you, does any of you note that I say that one fairly often? I just, I want to create, and God wants to create a church where we all feel safe, where we feel respected, where we feel honoured. And so I've tried to, as a pastor, honour you. And in all my communications with you, I try to be honouring and respectful. I try to, to create a culture where it's just not what we do in Andrew's Farm Community Church family of putting each other down. We don't do that in our church. That's not respectful. And if you've got a um, conflict with somebody in our church, which is inevitable in human families and churches, I hope and pray, and it's what I've been observing, that our church will deal with conflicts respectfully. Amen? Amen. Is that the culture you want to see built in the Andrews Farm Community Church as we be a river of life and hope, transforming, bringing the impact of the gospel to our community? I'll just, does anyone else want to just highlight one more before I move on? Did anyone else? Yes, David. Discipleship. Now, I'm not surprised that Mr. Alpha over there and who's been in discipleship world for many years. Yeah. So, so David, you want to see our church vibrantly, intentionally, discipling and people being discipled in Andrews Farm Community Church. What a great, thank you, that's good. Well, uh, there's others and I'll, I'll move on from there. But please, when I highlight those, take them in. Maybe just say a little silent prayer. Lord, help Andrews Farm reflect those values every Sunday and in our relationships when we interact at other times as well. I did print off just to be a little bit sort of like, you know, in your face, a little bit intentional, heaps of these today. I'd love you to put that in your Bible or maybe on your fridge. Or I just thought, I felt the Lord prompt me, we just press home, Lindsay, today. These are the values that this church treasures. So there should be plenty along the seats. And I'm just saying, I, yeah, you may not, you might choose to ignore it, that's okay, but I, I'm hoping you'll say, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll take that and that's going to help me remember what is important in what we build as a community, as a church, as a family. So, um, I probably could have made them bigger, I don't know, but I, I just thought I'd give everyone a copy, so I'd love you all just to take one of those and uh, are you hearing my spirit? That's, that's what we want to build in our church, that's, that's more important than any building, it's how we treat each other and what our focus is and what our vision is, our values and our vision. That's what I feel God put on my heart on this AGM Vision Sunday and I generally uh, present this message or a sort of a shape of it every, uh, every year as we have our AGM and rem remind us of that. So, uh, Jan told me last week, if we could have that next slide, 
that at the Performing Arts Centre at St. Columba, it was, it was six years ago, Jan, wasn't it? You were telling me that the, if we have the next slide, that was the location, that's on the inside. It was six years ago, last Sunday, at 4 p.m., we had our launch. So that's, that's a photo of when this church started six years ago up at a school in Andrews Farm. And uh, we had a lot of people there. We had balloons and a big AFCC. You know, it was very, very special. And Jan, I think you were saying one of your grandkids was born on that day. Is that what, is that what you were saying? A birthday? Yeah, so you... I didn't know that. That was so... The 29th of October is significant for you. So that was when we officially were born. We'd had about a year of preparation. Uh, the core group, which started off about uh, eight people, then we started doing public prayers in um, St. Columba. Uh, about, for about five months, we had about 30 people come to the prayer meeting and then on, uh, during 2017. And then on that Sunday, we, we, had, we advertised everywhere. Uh, we, we spent money on flyers. We letterboxed the whole of Andrew's farm. We put it on Facebook. And we had maybe about 250 to 300 people come to our very first service. That was six years ago. So happy birthday, happy anniversary. That's when this church started. Uh, and it was the fruit of prayer and vision of the uh, Salisbury and the Playford uh, Baptist churches. The Elizabeth Church of Christ were all part of that. Uh, Clovercrest were part of it too and a little bit of Gawler. And we, we celebrated our launch. Then um, we moved to Crafter Street. If we could just have... Uh, and this sort of dingy, very humble, uh, very sort of old, uh, sort of, you know, it was pretty, pretty basic building. But I, I, I loved that building. And for two years we were there. And some of us put in blood, sweat and tears for two years. And uh, on the inside it looks a lot nicer than that. Uh, and we were going to be there for five to six years, according to the developer. And so we put money and some of us were, you know, we, 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 we sort of loved that. I, I, I really, I thought it was, it was special. And, and I really am grateful. It's a humble place, but it was special for us. And we, we had our second sort of chapter there. St. Columba and then Crafter Street. And then COVID happened and the government put money out. And the developer rang me up. He said, Lindsay, I told you you could have that building for five years, but you can only have it for two you got to get out of there. And so we got kicked out. I, I did share at one of our AGM meetings a few years ago, I had to process some anger. I, I felt pretty angry that we thought we had that building uh, to build a next s sort of consolidation of the life of our church and it got taken away from us. Anyway, we trust God in his sovereignty and so we had that time in, in, uh, in um, Crafter Street. And then we were sort of like um, refugees. We had no home. And then I knocked on the door of the northern communities of hope. And this is where we are today. It's a church of Christ. Uh, it's not even a Baptist church, but they were graciously let us use it. And so at the end of this year, which is nearly upon us, we'll have been here for two years. So two years at St. Columba, where we birthed, two years at Crafter, and then now nearly two years here. God, God um, provided, and um, we'll have a little bit more on the next steps. Uh, if you're able to stay for our AGM after this service, I'll, I'll just uh, go into that a, a little bit more. I'll just bring us back to the Ephesian reading, and uh, if you could just have the next slide, thank you. He chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given in the one he loves. I just want to emphasize this passage has been um, pivotal and important it's been directing my ministry and my preaching and the heart of our church theologically uh, over uh, our six years and i just bring us back to this just briefly now and just invite you he chose us in him before the creation of the world 
My friends, you were known by God before the world was even made. How staggering is that? And when I am evangelizing people and I'm trying to describe to them what it means to be a Christian in our current time here in Australia, I refer to these three key words. If you have a look uh, at the next slide, thank you. Identity, we know where we come from. We know who we are. We know we're important. We know we're special. And today, maybe you've heard me preach this now, if you've been around a while, quite a few times. I keep coming back to it. But I want to reassure you today, you are, uh, your identity, you are special. Uh, God, the personal Father, he, he knew you and your name before the world began. And, and, and this, in our fallen, satanic and rebellious world, it screams the opposite messages. The world and even some people in their fallenness will scream at you that you are no good, uh, that you have no value, uh, that you are of no importance. But the Father, I say to you today in Jesus' name, He knew you and your, your existence is important and meaningful. Can you drink that in afresh today in our, in our service? And then in Ephesians 1, it talks about our redemption, that He, he, he sent His Son and uh, his blood shed. We had that in, reinforced in communion today. And so uh, sometimes our guilt gets on top of us. And we wonder if we're forgiven. We wonder if God could still love us. My friends, in Christ, you, are, you don't only know your identity, but you know you're secure. You have a security, that, my friends, that no one can take away. Amen? You are secure in Christ. He died for you. He loves you. He's redeemed you. It says in our reading, he adopted you into his family. You belong to him. Now, that transcends any denomination. You can belong to him as a Baptist or an Anglican or a Pentecostal. Uh, the church uh, denominational um, uh, boundaries are unimportant in these ideas. It doesn't matter which church you belong to. You are known and you are loved. And you are redeemed. And then when I'm sharing the gospel, I usually tell them about Ephesians 1.10 as well, which says about a promise that one day Jesus will come back. And in fact, many people, especially because of recent events, think that it might be very soon. And that may well be or it may not be. But we have a destiny. And it's an incredible future. It's a restored relationship with God in new heaven and new earth that's even, it's even impossible to describe. And so when we die, when I die, when you die, we have an eternal future and hope to look forward to. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that wonderful? I, 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 I encourage you to be excited about that. I love my life and I love my wife and family and I love my ministry and people, but I, I sort of can't wait to die to be with God in eternity in a whole new realm of existence. So that's a hope. That's my destiny. So my friends, the river of life and hope, the impact we're making on our community in this area, would you agree with me? The locals in Andrews Farm and Davron Park they need to know they have an identity and a security and a destiny. I'm looking for a big amen. amen. Because that's what motivates my mission. I'm here with you today and I help with God's, uh, God's leading to start a new church. Not, 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 for a, um, not, not for a human level, but, but at a spiritual level. The people are loved in Andrew's farm, and they need to know that. And there are so many people today, would you agree with me, who are lost, who are thirsty, who are, who are damaged, and they need to know their love. They need to know the, the, the uh, security of Christ. The gospel cares about human needs, and we give people food, and we help them practically. But here's a summary. Uh, next slide, please, where... We just sum up what we teach. 
Now, this should look familiar to you, but I'm going to keep bringing it up forever because it's the doctrines that we uh, are foundational for Christians and they're transcending denominations as well. God created us, which I've been talking about. There is the fall, which is real, where every human being is fallen and in rebellion against God. And it doesn't matter who you're talking to, they are fallen and they're sinners and they need to repent. And so when we do our barbecues and we meet person A at the, in East Parkway or West Parkway or somewhere and they say to us, all right, so you're from this church, Andrew's Farm, what, what do you believe? What, what does it mean if I sign on with you? It means that you were made by a God that's real but that all humanity has turned their back on this God that made them and that there is a saviour who came and redeemed you on the cross and that one day he's going to restore all of humanity. That's the message, the gospel message. And uh, if we miss any of those elements, it's not really Christian. And there are some people who've watered down the Christian faith just to point one and says there is a loving creator who made everything and the world reflects him. But they never go on to the third, the, the, the next three. And I just, I, I, I believe today as I preach that you receive this. But when we're presenting the gospel, unless and until the Holy Spirit brings a deep conviction in a person's heart, they are a sinner. They've rebelled against the Creator who loves them and made them. They are not a Christian. They may attend church. They may be a good person. But until the conviction of sin, they are not saved and will not go to heaven. We need to teach the full gospel and be unapologetic. Do I get an amen for that? As I rebuild, uh, I teach the building of our uh, foundations here. The last part of my message, and I'll try and make this just fairly brief, but I'm, I want you to just look at the slides and take it in. I'm just thinking maybe, uh, Mark, who's put the air conditioner on, on, uh, on cool? I don't know whether it's just me, I'm getting hot, and maybe because I'm... I'm excited today on our AGM Vision Sunday, but I just think it's getting a bit stuffy. When people um, show interest in our church over these last six years, the elders and I, about four or five years ago, uh, we developed this, this sheet. And it's called Getting to Know Andrews Farm Community Church. And if somebody wants to be a member... And there are many people in our church who are not members but actively part of our church, which we, that's fine. But if you want to be a member, uh, we want to teach you what our expectations are. We want you to know what it means to belong to Andrews Farm Community Church. We want you to be clear about our expectations. I was recently listening to a preacher in America teaching on expectations and here's a little extreme example, which don't get overreacting to the example, but I teach it, I say it by illustration. There was a guy in his church who was married and he started having an affair with a, another person, another woman, who wasn't his wife. And this pastor who was doing the teaching, he went to him and he said, now, what's going on? You, you, you're married? You, you, you can't be... And the, and the guy said, well, go away. Get, you, you've got no right to challenge me on what I live, how I live. And the pastor said he clearly hadn't communicated the expectations either of the scriptures or of the local church. And that sort of uh, triggered him or inspired him to be more clear about what is expected of a Christian in a local Baptist church. To go around and have affairs with other people while you're married is not meeting our expectations. But there may be other things too. So I just want to take you through this, getting to know AFCC. And I, I, um, if you would like to take a copy of this, I've got some multiple copies here. If you aren't a member here and you would like to know, well, what is the meaty side of what this church stands for? 
then this is a summary of it. It's obviously not comprehensive, but we, we did our best to make it simple and clear and uh, an overview. Uh, you're welcome to take a, a copy of that. But um, I, I want to take you through this. This is our doctrines. Doctrines are so important. If we could just have the next slide. And um, the Bible is God's word. And so what right have I got to say to you, this is how you should live? Or what right have I got to say, your sins are forgiven? It's the authority of the Bible. The Bible is God's word. Amen? That's a, that's a, a clear expectation that, that, that we stand on here. God is one God in three persons. This church believes in the Trinity. There are cults in, in Elizabeth and uh, our communities that teach that there is no Trinity. There is only the one, one God. But we teach the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's biblical and it's a foundational, meaty, sort of uncompromising truth. The Lord Jesus is fully God. And I have preached on this from time to time, particularly when I've been preaching through the Gospel of John in the New Testament, but other books as well. And we emphasize the deity of Christ is a technical term that gets used. So today, my friends, it's so important as you sit here and we reaffirm our beliefs and, and we get set now for the next chapter of our church's future, uh, we stand on the truth that Jesus Christ is fully God and we cannot compromise that. I've sort of outlined in my earlier message, uh, earlier point about the sin of all people, that every person has rebelled against God. Uh, I invite you just to be receiving that afresh today. There's nobody that you will meet tomorrow who is not a sinner. All of us in this room are sinners against a pure and holy God. But are we forgiven? We um, believe that all people may be reunited with God. And I trust that today uh, you are one of those people reunited with God. To be reunited with God, it is necessary for us to turn away from our sins. I really hope today afresh I can remind you there was a moment when you said, I am a sinner and I'm going to turn away and I'm going to seek to do my best to live a holy life, a godly life. When we do this, we in the Baptist church, a little bit different to the Pentecostal church, we believe the Holy Spirit comes into us. Now, the Pentecostals and other variations of Christian faith, which we love and respect, believe that there's like a part one where you get saved and then there's a part two where you get filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit. We respect that doctrine, but we don't teach that doctrine. When you are saved, you are filled. You are given the Holy Spirit in all His fullness and then we continue to be open to Him and sometimes gifts unfold into the future but we don't teach a second, teach a doctrine of a second experience. One day, everyone will rise from the dead and be judged by Christ. One day, my friends, this is what this church teaches, you will die, I will die and we will face judgment. And if we're covered over by the blood of Christ, we are ushered into an eternity with God and His beautiful presence. And if, when we die, we are not covered over by the blood of Christ, we go to hell and we're separated from God forever. That's heavy. That's a hard message. But it's what this church believes. We bring the river of life and this truth to our community. And then the return in Christ of Jesus in power and glory and final judgment. Can, can you say amen to those truths? That's what we believe. It's tough. It's hard. It's a bit uh, uncomfortable for some people. And there are some churches who avoid being brave about those doctrines and waver over them and pretend they're not there. But that's the teaching that this church believes. Now, just a couple more points. We believe in baptism and we invite people to be water baptised. If we could just have the next slide. It's the way that believers express their faith in Christ. Uh, they do this by being immersed in water. There are some churches that just sprinkle on the forehead their, their babies as baptism. We in the Baptist tradition and the Andrews Farm Community Church believe that when somebody wants to get baptised, they go all the way under the water. 
and, uh, and some people uh, might think, it, you know, you have to go forwards or you go backwards. That really is, um, people can have a personal preference on that. But biblically, you've got to go under the water somehow as a symbol of burial and death. And then you come up out of the water as a symbol of new life and a new beginning. Hallelujah. So we teach that as a, a clear pointer, a sacrament towards the death, burial of, and, and resurrection of Jesus. And we take the Lord's Supper. Uh, we've done that today in our, with David Teep taking us through the communion. And we believe these elements um, are very simple um, and they're just sort of ordinary human or natural elements, a bit of grape juice, a bit of wafer. There's nothing, there's nothing magical about them. But we see the Lord's Supper as uh, pointing us to the dying of Christ and he's coming back again and we do it regularly so that the church is reminded of our foundations. Now, you might go to a lion's club or a fishing club or a rotary club or a school and they'll have all their teachings and traditions, but they won't be regularly pointing people to the cross of Jesus. That's what the church does. That's what this church does. And it's why we have communion to remind us. Now, my last little bit is the expectations. If you want to be a member of this church, here's what I expect. Here's what the elders expect. Here's what the community of faith uh, has uh, have brought together to, to, to expect. That you will progress in obedience to Christ through daily Bible study and prayer and walking in the power of the Spirit. We want you, we're hungry for you to read your Bible, to pray regularly, to pray earnestly, uh, to be, to be uh, open to the power of the Holy Spirit. And, that, and that we, 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 we make reference to that quite regularly. And, and we need to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit. He's an inner voice and sometimes he uses circumstances. But let's be open. Our God is a living God who speaks to us in our discipleship. We expect you to worship regularly with the church family. Sadly, over the culture of Australia and America and other uh, Western countries, the average attendance of church has declined significantly. And uh, when I was a kid, in the uh, decades ago, if you were a Christian, you went to church on Sunday morning and you went to church on Sunday night. Can anybody remember that? That used to be the culture. Now... What is interpreted as generally the story is that if you go to church on a Sunday morning once a month, then you are regularly active in your church. That's the change in culture. Now, I, I don't like that change. I, I think we should be re worshipping regularly. But, but I want you to hear the tone of this. The tone of this message is love and not guilt and not aggression and not anger. If you or people in our church choose not to come to our church every Sunday, we love you. And there's no sense of condemnation. I want you to come to church because I love you. And God loves to meet you in worship and praise and worship and teaching. But generally, if you commit to be a member of this church, unless you're sick, or unless you're on holidays, or unless some emergencies happened, you will have it in your calendar, your schedule, to come to church. It won't be, oh, oh, no, I don't think I want to go this week. No, no, that's not an expectation of this church. But, but not because we're mean, not because we're trying to squash anybody. Can you hear my tone? We want you to come because you love God and God loves you. It's an expectation to be a member of the Andrews Farm Community Church. Now, if a person misses a Sunday, well, that's fine. If a person misses two Sundays, that's generally fine. If I see that somebody's missed three Sundays, I generally ring them and say, or I get one of the elders to contact them, are you okay? We're missing you. This is an expectation of the church. Can I ask you, is it your expectation that you would expect the pastor or the elders or a pastoral person to reach out to you if you didn't come for three weeks or four weeks? Would that be your expectation? Good. I'm happy about that. We're on the same page. No, no, fair question. I'm trying to think how I would respond to that, Mark. If, 
if, if they've got to work and they're um, rostered to be on a shift on Sunday morning, then, uh, yeah, David's waving around, it happens regularly to him, then my and their expectations, we would, we would adjust because they can't make it. And we would say, that's, we, that we understand, that's, that's fine. But that's a different scenario than people choosing out of whatever motivation to not come regularly. So, we do put our service up on the, um, uh, on the uh, uh, YouTube channel. Yes, that way they can keep in touch. But Mike's making a very, very, very good point. And, and there are churches that have different services at different times to accommodate for people who work on Sundays. I, I thank Mike for alerting me to that. But, but if, you're, if you're feeling pressure from me and guilt, that's not my heart. If you don't want to come to our church, that's, we love you and, and we respect your decision. But if you're a member, generally, I'd expect you to be coming on a Sunday morning unless something else is coming up. I hope that's reasonable. I hope that that's okay. Um, to be actively involved in a small group, that's probably a little bit less uh, perceived differently because not everyone can get to a small group and not all groups the time suit. But in principle, we would love you to be participating in some way in a, in a small community setting with the life of our church, our light groups, as Mike would sometimes say. The next slide, thank you. Serve faithfully in ministry by using your spiritual gifts. And if you're with us over a period of time, I would generally ask you this question. What is your spiritual gift and how can you serve in the life of Andrew's farm? And uh, we've got some tools that we point people to to help them discover their spiritual gifts. So if you're part of us, an expectation would be you won't just sit there, you will work, you will serve, you will help in a way that God has wired you and that will help bless God and bless our community. Money. What a difficult topic for a pastor to talk about. But this is the expectation of a member of the Andrews Farm Community Church, that you will give some of your money regularly, not just intermittently, but regularly to the church to pay the costs of running the Andrews Farm Community Church and to honour God with your tithes and offerings as the Scriptures teach. And so this is an expectation of all people in the life of our church family. I invite you to consider that uh, seriously and, and if you say, I'm going to give that some thought, Lindsay, and I'm going to come back and say, no, I can't afford to give anything, then we will say, that's okay. You, you're not going to get pounced on. You're not going to get judged. No one, no one holds anyone accountable for our financial giving. It's all um, anonymous and uh, no one knows. But I invite you, to see that it's an expectation of a member of our church to give financially. The Bible talks about 10%. I do know, uh, myself included, there are a number of people who give 10% of their income to our church to help run Andrews Farm Community Church. That's a biblical principle that's generally taught in most churches. But no one's checking up and no one expects. There are some people who give more than 10%. And we, we, we say, praise God for that. But generally, the expectation is the offering that we used to do in the um, old days where we'd go by. Can you remember those days we used to take up the offering? We don't do that anymore since COVID. But we have an offering box that people put money in. And the majority, over 90% of people in most churches now give electronically through uh, the bank and just send, send money. You'll hear at our AGM, if you're not going to be at the AGM, currently on the budget of what it runs, what it costs to run this church financially, we are $300 a week short. And so we are under budget by $300. Our budget, which comes in, uh, expected and needed is $2,500. And currently we're getting around $2,200, which is less than we need. If that trend continued, and if it went on and our reserves were used up, then the Andrews Farm Community Church, with me as the full-time pastor, would not run. We would close the church because we take money to pay the rent, to pay the salary, to operate the church. And of course, 
we give 10% of the money that comes in, the 2,200, we save that up and we give it away in missions and we give a lot of money away in our statement at the back you'll see where all that's gone our church has given away thousands of dollars over this last year helping many many groups and individuals praise the lord that's a result of your generosity but an expectation of a member of our church is to support financially the ministry through your generous giving and if you hear me saying Lindsay's telling me to give my money to the church i don't want to do that i would say don't misunderstand me I don't want your money. If, if, if you're giving because I've made you give, don't give. Don't give your money. Give it freely. Give it generously. Give it heartily. If you're doing it grudgingly, don't give it because that's not the spirit and the culture of this church. Um, I trust God will provide for us, but, but it's got to come from the heart. It's got to be that you capture the vision and share the vision of this church and support me and the life of the church that you would give any of your money. But an expectation in principle, do, have I communicated that clearly? If you're a member, you will attend, you'll participate and you will give some of your money. Oh, Lord, forgive me if I've mucked any of that up. I, I tried to do my best there. Be responsive, uh, influence your network of friends. We hope and pray that you will tell other people uh, that, they, that they need to know Jesus and that you will encourage them to be involved in either our church or a Christian church. That's really up to you. But we want to build God's kingdom, this community of faith and all of those in our region. But we encourage you, um, influence people to become Christ's disciples. Be responsive to the church leaders. Um, that means having respect for me as the pastor and to the elders who get appointed and elected, and that, and that you will honour us as the leaders of the church. The Scriptures teach that you do that. I ask you to honour us as the leaders of the church. That's an expectation of a member or the life of our church. Uh, that you'll attend members' meetings. There happens to be one in a few minutes' time, if you're able to stay. If you can't, the spirit of our church is love and culture of, of, of acceptance and uh, value. You can't stay, that's fine. Serve and encourage each other members uh, and encourage other members of the church. Please, can I encourage you to take every opportunity, listen to this, to build each other up and serve each other and care for each other? That's what we're trying to build as the river of life and hope. That's the spirit that we're trying to communicate. And of course, be an agent of justice and mercy. And that's where our church will have no racism and no prejudice based on colour or creed or language or gender. Uh, we will, or, or, or transgender, or sexual orientation. Uh, we, we will be an agent of true justice in this church, a culture of acceptance and love. Amen? If you want to know more about those pastoral ethics, I just have the last, nearly, nearly the last slide. Thanks, uh, Len Singh. Oh, I didn't have it up there. So pastoral ethics, um, uh, we invite you to come and talk to us. Sometimes that could be quite complicated. And uh, we want you to um, uh, be open us with, with us about that. So, the planet Mars, it needs water if there's going to be human life. The Andrews Farm community and Davron Park, if it's going to have spiritual life, it needs the message of Christ and the gospel, the life-giving message. Can I invite the team to come up? And I want to uh, today invite you, if you'd like to know more, uh, about our church, uh, you can grab one of these. That, what I've just gone through really is what I take through a members class. On the back, uh, there's a form that you fill out some, some information and we let the elders know that you'd like to be a member uh, and then we welcome you as members. That, that's on the back of this form. I've got some copies here, but I'd like to take you through that if you'd like to become a member. Uh, see me or the elders about it. But I want to call you to recommit to our vision. Six years now, We've been running, this is our sixth AGM, our sixth sort of time of gathering and, uh, in a, uh, annually as a, as a group. And uh, can, I, can I say to you as we sing our last song, maybe you just say to God, Lord, 
I, I really love all that Lindsay said. I love the vision of this church. I love the values of this church. I love the heart of this church. I'm committing myself afresh to you. I want to see every church in the north prosper and grow, but this is the one that you've called me to belong to. This is the one I'm going to financially support. This is the one I'm going to pray for, and I'm going to love and serve and work across. Uh, I invite you today on this AGM Vision Sunday to say, yes, Lord, I refresh my commitment to, to you, Lord, uh, and to what God's called this church to be. And uh, wherever that river goes, where you go and I go, we are bringing Christ and we're bringing life, the river of life. Let's sing our, our uh, final song before I pray to close. Hello. Oh. Can everyone stand this morning? We're going to sing our last song.
as I close and pray, I remind you of the walk in the world, walk of the world next week. And uh, you might just like to drive down one street of uh, this area, Andrews Farm, Devron Park, and uh, say, I've been inspired by the message and, and the vision, and I'm going to pray for our city. Lord, we lift up this map before you. We thank you that where the river is flowing, you're bringing life and you're changing Andrew's farm. Hallelujah. And as we close today, Father, I just pray your blessing over everyone that's part of Andrew's Farm Community Church and I thank you for them. And I send them out, Lord, on mission afresh today to this community and to the world in your name. And God, I thank you. I thank you that you chose us before the creation of the world out of love for us. And we stand before you now with an identity and a security and a destiny that no one can take away. We pray that over Andrew's farm, Lord, and the many homes and families and broken people who yet don't know who they are and feel afraid and insecure and have no hope for the future. We speak your love and life and hope of Jesus over them in Jesus' name today. May uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.